You know, if you were to ask me, what do you hate the most about working with computers? It'd probably be installing the operating system. Now, over time, it's gotten easier, although it probably hasn't really gotten that much faster, though, but at least it has gotten better in one way. The questions the install routine asks you, I mean, most of them, at least nowadays, they're asked right up front at the start of the installation or right at the end of the installation. So what that means is for a big chunk of the time that it takes to install Windows, I can at least be off doing other things and not staring at a progress bar for 30 minutes or more. Because honestly, I've got better things to do with my time than to sit here installing software. So now that you know how I feel about installing operating systems, and probably you might feel the same, you're going to understand why technologies like the Windows Deployment Services, or WDS, are high on my list of technologies that I think you guys need to know about. So that's exactly what we're going to learn here in this video. How we can use WDS to remotely install one or a hundred operating systems on new machines and to make it so that we've got very little to do in order to get these machines installed. And that's just the way I like it. So that's what WDS allows us to do. It allows us to remotely install Windows onto machines with very little effort. Now, the only real gotcha with Windows Deployment Services, though, is that it is designed for rolling out installations of Windows 2008, Windows Vista, and Windows 7. So bear that in mind anyway, because if you're planning to roll out a bunch of older versions of Windows, then this product isn't for you. Now, up front, I will admit that this video is really going to be a two-part video. Obviously, this video here is about the Windows Deployment Services, and in the second part, we're going to take this automatic installation process up a level. We're going to ratchet it up and we'll take a look at using the Windows Automated Installation Kit to create what's called an answer file. And we can use that answer file with WDS. So even though we have these two videos and they carry different names, you're going to want to watch this one first and then the creating an answer file video obviously directly afterward. Now, the good thing about Windows Deployment Services, though, is that it doesn't cost you anything. Well, apart from the cost, obviously, of having Windows 2008, because WDS is included as part of Windows Server 2008. But it is a role that we will need to install first. But before we go and switch over to a Windows 2008 server and start using it, though, first thing we'll need to understand is that there are some additional requirements that you'll need to meet before you can use WDS. So firstly, we are going to need to have uh, Active Directory running. So that means you need a domain controller in your network. Now, if you haven't yet installed a domain controller, which is probably unlikely, then you should head off and watch our videos on how to do that and then come back here. So secondly, you're also going to need a DNS server. That's OK. If you've already got a domain controller, then you're already going to have a DNS server as well. Most likely, you'll probably have it on the same server. Now, we'll also need to have a DHCP server, and that can be on a totally separate server to your domain controller, or a different box, it doesn't really matter. And finally, we're also going to have to have somewhere to store our images, which are the files for the operating systems that we want to install. Those will need to be installed on an NTFS partition, which nowadays really doesn't need to be mentioned since pretty much everyone uses it. But it still is a requirement, so you're aware of it just in case. So what we're going to do here in this video, we're going to jump on to my domain controller, which I've got in my lab here, and it already has these prerequisites installed. It's got Active Directory. We do have DNS. It is using NTFS, uh, although I'm going to have to install a DHCP server, so I'm told. So each of these things we'll discuss in other videos if you're not aware of them yet, but you can check out those videos if you're unfamiliar with these roles. Now, I will say, though, in a production environment, if you can afford to do so, you shouldn't install WDS on your domain controller, which is what I'll be doing in this video. Now, you can do it, of course. Well, obviously, because if it wasn't possible, then this wouldn't be a very successful video. It's just not recommended. So leave your domain controller to looking after Active Directory and DNS, and that's pretty much it. Put WDS on its own server or on a server that's not being heavily used. So as long as the server you choose to install WDS on is a member of your domain, then you're good to go. So firstly, we're going to go ahead and we'll install the DHCP role because I don't have a DHCP server anywhere in my network. And then we'll move on and we'll install WDS. Now, once we've got WDS installed, we can add the images we need to our server and then we'll install maybe two or three machines using WDS. 
Now, in the next video, of course, I did make mention of that, we're going to deploy another server, but in that video, we'll use an answer file that we'll create using the Windows Automated Installation Kit. So let's get started, and firstly, we'll install DHCP. Now, since DHCP is a Windows 2008 role, we'll need to fire up the server manager first by clicking this little grey icon here in the quick launch area. Then over here on the right, we'll click the Add Roles link, and that's going to start up the Add Role wizard. Now, the role we want is a DHCP server, so we're going to check that box, and we'll click Next. Now this screen here just tells us a little bit about DHCP and we're not going to go into DHCP in any detail here in this video because we do have other videos dedicated to discussing DHCP and you can go ahead and watch those if you need some more information. So for here we'll just bypass this screen, we'll click Next. Now we'll need to select which interface this server is going to be using for servicing our DHCP requests by clients. Well, you can see I've only got one network card anyway so there's nothing to do here, just ensure this box is checked. Now here's the domain that we'll be installing this DHCP server to, jorkus.com, and the IP address of the DNS server. So there's nothing really to do here. We could validate this if we like, just to make sure that is a valid IP address for our DNS server, which it is. So we'll click Next. Now are we going to use WINS? God, I hope not. No, we don't need it for WDS, so we're going to leave the default here, and WINS is definitely not required, and we'll click Next. Now we need to set up a scope here, and a scope is just a simple range of IP addresses that this DHCP server is allowed to hand out to clients that come asking for an IP address. So to do that, up here we'll click the Add button. We'll need to give this scope a name. So for the sake of the argument here, I'm just going to call this one WDS. Now we'll need to populate the next two fields here with a starting IP address and an end IP address. So let's just use the starting IP address range of 10.32. 0.90 and the end IP address will make it 10.32.0.100 as 10 of them will be sufficient for us to work with WDS. Now just make sure of two things here though. Firstly that this range of IP addresses aren't already in use elsewhere and secondly that you've allocated enough IP addresses for the clients that need a dynamic address. Now down the bottom here I'm going to add in a subnet mask of 255.224.0.0 and we'll add in a default gateway of 10.32.0.1 and now we'll click OK alright and there's our scope which we've just created so we can click Next now here we can configure our DHCP version 6 stateless mode and for the purposes of this video we're not really interested in DHCP v6 so we're going to leave the default here to enable stateless mode for this server and we'll click Next now for IPv6, we will need to tell the wizard our domain name here and our DNS server. And again, this is already populated, so there's nothing to do here except to click Continue, or rather click Next. Now finally, our DHCP server does need to be authorized in order to work, so it can start handing out dynamic IP addresses. So we're going to leave the default setting here, which is to use the credentials that I'm logged on with right now to authorize this DHCP server. But you can use the middle option here, if you'd like to specify a different username and password, or at the bottom here, you could choose not to authorize this DHCP server right now, but do be aware that you do need to authorize the server or it won't be able to hand out IP addresses, and that really defeats the purpose of installing this in the first place. So we're going to leave the default here to authorize this using our current credentials. We'll click Next, and we're ready to roll. So we'll click Install, and obviously this is going to take a minute or so to install this DHCP role here, so I'm going to pause the video and we'll come back in a moment once this is all complete. Alright, well we're done. DHCP has now been installed, it's authorized, and our scope has been created, so we are good to start handing out IP addresses to our clients. Now you will note that I have got one more warning message here, just telling us that Windows Automatic Updating is not enabled. Now that's fine for the purposes of my lab. Obviously, in a production environment, this is something you'd probably want to address. So we'll click Close here, and we can now move on to do what we came here for, and that's to install WDS. So again, at the top here, we're going to click Add Roles. That'll bring up the wizard we've seen before. Now, right down the bottom here, we're going to have to check this box here next to Windows Deployment Services, or WDS. And we'll click Next. 
And this wizard, by the way, is a pretty simple wizard. It's pretty much just a next, next wizard, and you're going to see that in a moment. Here we've got our introduction screen here. You can read that if you like. Now, right here also, under this Things to Note section, you will see here that it does tell us that we do need Active Directory, DHCP, and DNS, as well as the NTFS petitions for the file store, something that we've already discussed. All right, well, let's click Next. Now, we can choose to install the deployment server, the transport server, or both, of course, which is the default as evidenced by our ticks here. Now, this transport server is a standalone role that's used for multicast data transfers. But on the other hand, the deployment server service is the full-blown WDS, which is what we want. But since the transport server service is a prerequisite for the deployment server service, we need to install them both anyway. So as it is, the defaults are the best choices here. Leave both boxes checked and click Next. Rightio, we're ready to go. It's such a simple wizard. We just need to click Install here. Now, like before, this will take a minute or so to install the WDS role. So we'll be pausing the video here and we'll come back in a moment once it's all done. Okay, it's complete. WDS is installed. It was successful. So we'll ignore again our Windows Automatic Updating message here. We'll click Close. And there's the four roles that we've got installed on this server. We've got our Active Directory, our DHCP, DNS, and of course our WDS, which is everything we need now for WDS to function. So let's get started, and we'll start by getting these remote machines built, the ones that we've been talking about. So we're going to click Start. We'll go to Administrative Tools, and let's fire up a copy of the Windows Deployment Services Console, which is where we're going to work with the images that we want to deploy. Okay, now over in this console here on the left hand side, we're going to expand servers. And you'll see here that this is the server we're on now, our WDS server, ladc.jorkus.com. Now you notice that it has this warning style exclamation mark over the icon, which is Microsoft code for you've got some more work to do. And they're right, yes, we do. But by the way, if you do have more than one WDS server in your network, and yes, you can have more than one if you want, you'll be able to manage that server from here. And all you need to do is simply right-click on the servers container here and choose Add Server. And then you can locate that server using this dialog box. All right, so first things first, we need to get rid of this yellow warning icon here. So we'll need to right-click on our server here, and we'll choose the top option to configure our server. And that's going to start up the WDS configuration wizard. Now, do note this bold section here. We've got a warning. To be able to use WDS, it does tell us we will need to be running Active Directory. We will need to have a DHCP server, DNS, obviously, and NTFS partitions to store our installation images. Now, we have been through that a couple of times now. And we've seen Microsoft list that a few times during the installation of WDS. So by now, you should understand what you need to have in order to get this WDS thing going. So let's click Next. Now the first thing we're asked to do here is to tell the wizard where we want to install the remote installation folder. Now this is the folder that's going to contain the files that we need to install our operating system. So first of all, this must be a folder that's on an NTFS drive. Now secondly, since we're going to be storing the image files for an entire operating system, or possibly multiple operating systems, you want to ensure that you've got enough space on that drive. So you can store these images on any folder or any drive you like, just as long as you have enough space, of course, and as long as the drive is using NTFS. So I'm going to leave the default path here, as you see it, which is just on my C drive in a folder called Remote Install. That's fine by me. You can call it whatever you like, really. We'll click Next. And since this is my system drive as well, I do get a warning message here asking, am I sure I want to do this? Because putting this sort of data on our system drive isn't recommended by Microsoft. But it doesn't matter, it works for the sake of the argument, so we'll click Yes. Now, since our WDS server also happens to be our DHCP server, this screen here now does have some relevance to us. Let's take a look at what it says. It says here, if a DHCP server is running on this server, then we'll need to check both of these boxes here so that WDS must be configured to not listen. That's not to listen on port 67, and 
the DHCP option tag 60 must be added to our DHCP scopes on our DHCP server. So what this means is this. DHCP listens on port 67 for DHCP broadcast, which of course what happens when a client is looking for a DHCP server. It's going to broadcast for one. Now since we're using WDS as well on this same server, which will also want to listen for those UDP broadcasts on port 67, we don't want DHCP to listen on port 67 as there's going to be a conflict. Now the second option here is to configure this DHCP option tag 60 to Pixie client. This PXE is pronounced Pixie by the way. This is the pre-execution bootstrap which exists to help a client boot from a network card. So the plan is that our clients will start up, they won't have any operating system installed so they'll broadcast for a DHCP server from their network card which is hopefully then going to be answered by our WDS server which will then start installing an operating system on the client. So by checking this bottom box here we're letting our DHCP server know that we have a Pixie server available which is WDS and then when it offers a lease to our clients they'll also learn about our WDS server in the offer packet that we send them. So we do need to check both of these boxes since our DHCP server is on the same server as WDS. However, if you're installing WDS on a totally separate server to your DHCP server, then don't check either of these two boxes. So hopefully that's cleared it up a little bit, but just to recap, if DHCP and WDS are on the same server, just like we're doing here, check both of these boxes. If they're on separate servers, then don't check either box. All right, with that understanding down, we'll now obviously check both of these boxes. We'll click Next. Here we can configure the Pixie server initial settings. And this is concerned with how we're going to deal with clients that broadcast. So from this server's perspective, we could do nothing and not respond to any clients. And that's a pretty good option to choose when you're in the process of building your WDS server. That way, it's not actually going to respond to any clients prematurely while you might still be in the process of configuring this server. And then you can come in here and configure one of the other options later on. Now, we could also choose to respond only to known clients. And a known client computer, by the way, is a computer whereby we've already created a computer account in Active Directory before the client is even connected to the network. And this is what we'd call a pre-staged client. Now, even though this isn't obviously intended to be a tutorial on pre-staged clients, how you'd set it up first is to find out what the globally unique identifier or the GUID of each machine is and then use that to create a computer account in Active Directory. Now this GUID is normally going to be the MAC address of the network card that's in a computer so if we just quickly click start and we'll open up a command prompt here and if we type in IP config slash all and let's just scroll up a little bit it's this MAC address here that would be the GUID. So let's just right click on this and click Mark and we can highlight that MAC address there. Now we hit Enter to copy that to the Windows clipboard. Now we'll go click Start. Administrative Tools will launch Active Directory Users and Computers. Now let's go to our Computers container here and let's right click and we'll create a new computer. Now we'll give this computer a name, let's just call it test for now, it doesn't really matter. We'll click next. And right here we'll need to check this box and then paste in the MAC address. Okay, so we've pasted that in. The next step will be to delete all of these hyphens that you see here. We don't need those. And finally, since a GUID needs to be 32 characters, we're going to have to enter in a bunch of zeros to pad this MAC address out. So we'll need to pad this with 20 zeros because we've got a 12 digit MAC address and these zeros will need to go at the front of the MAC address. Now you'll know when you've hit 32 characters by the way because you'll see this next button suddenly become available and there you go. All right, so there's our 32 character unique identifier which would be a real GUID for this server that we're on right now. So now, when a computer appears on the network that has this MAC address, then Active Directory will know about it ahead of time, and this is what's called 
a pre-staged client. All right, well, that's a little tutorial there, a little aside, so let's just close this. We don't really need it at the moment. Let's go back to our WDS console, and you can see here our final option down the bottom is to respond to all client computers, both known and unknown. Now, this one here is certainly the easiest method to work with, but of course it does come at a price, with security being the biggest risk here, since potentially a user could come into your network with his laptop from home, plug it in, and essentially get a free copy of Windows Server 2008 or Windows 7 or Windows Vista or whatever it is that you have to offer. Probably not what you want to happen. So in a production environment, my preference would be to set this to the top option, to not respond to anything, and then switch over to respond only to known clients only once I finished setting up WDS. But for the purposes of my lab here, I'm just going to go with the bottom option because there's no one who's going to be coming in here and plugging in other machines. Well, obviously, I hope not anyway, but in my lab, I think we're pretty safe. Now, we could also check this box down the bottom here to notify an administrator if an unknown client is requesting an operating system. But again, in my lab, I'm not going to worry about that. In a production environment, if I was using this bottom option, I most certainly would want to check this box. All right, well, let's click Next. And WDS is going to set itself up. Now it's going to start up the WDS service. It'll configure DHCP, and it won't take long, probably, in fact, there you go, 10, 15 seconds or so. So it's definitely not long enough to walk away and grab a coffee. Okay, well, obviously it's done. So the next step here is to add images to our WDS server. Now, obviously, we can leave this box checked. We could do it now, or we could do it later. Let's do it now. We'll leave this box checked. We'll click Finish, and that's going to start up the Add Image Wizard where we'll need to browse to the location where we have our images stored. Okay, well right now, I actually don't have any images stored anywhere. So, where do we get them from? Well, we'll get them from our Windows operating system DVD, of course. So, I've already gone ahead and I've put a Windows 2008 DVD in my drive. So, let's click Start. Let's open up our, our computer here. And let's just expand this and go to my D drive, my DVD drive. Now we'll go to the Sources folder, and we're looking for two files. And In fact, rather than run down there, let's just do a search for WIM files here. Okay, and it's found two files. It's found a file called boot.wim and install.wim. Now it's these two files that we'll need to copy to our remote install folder that we just set up a moment ago in this video. Now let's quickly just talk about what these two files do. Now, firstly, the top one, boot.wim. This file is used to boot a computer. It's the file that gets accessed when you start up your computer, and it's designed to get it ready to install the operating system. Now, remember, these clients, when they boot up, they've got a blank hard drive. There's no operating system on them, so they need to boot somehow. Now, it's this boot.wim file that makes it all possible. Now, the install.wim file, this is the file that's used when the actual installation of that operating system takes place. And you'll notice that this file here is pretty big. It's 2.46 gig. So that's the size of the file for a 64-bit edition of Windows 2008, which is what I'm looking at right now. So this file here contains everything that we need to install a 64-bit edition of Windows 2008 on our system. So boot.wim boots the machine. Install.wim installs the operating system. So at least the names of these files give it away, just in case you happen to forget which file does what. All right, so let's just minimize Explorer here and let's go back to the WDS wizard. And it really doesn't matter if you're pulling those files from the DVD or you happen to have them stored somewhere on a network drive. The process is exactly the same. What we'll need to do here is click Browse. We'll expand Computer. We'll expand our DVD drive. We'll select the Sources folder because that's where those two files are in the Sources folder. We'll click OK, and then we'll click Next. Now, the next thing the wizard's going to ask us to do is to create an image group. Now, an image group, this is simply a group where we want to store the images that we can deploy. Now, the reason we want to create a group with a meaningful name here and not leave it at the default name here of Image Group 1 is that potentially we could have quite a few different operating systems that we could have on hand to deploy, so putting them into separate groups is a pretty good idea. Now, since I'm going to be deploying a 64-bit edition of Windows 2008, I'm going to call my group here Windows 2008 X64. 
Again, call it what you like. We'll click Next. All right, we'll get our summary here, which is going to take the images from our D drive in the Sources folder. And it's going to place them into our image group here called Windows 2008 X64. You can see we've got one boot image. And check this, we've got eight install images. Now, I've no doubt that you guys listening to this video would have installed Windows 2008 before. Most likely you've done it manually, which is why you're listening to this video, of course, I'll assume. Now, when you install Windows 2008, it asks you which version of Windows 2008 you want to install. Whether it's a standard edition, the enterprise edition, the data center edition. It's also got your server core options as well. So that means we've got eight different versions of Windows 2008. Now that's where this eight comes from, as there are eight different versions of Windows 2008 on this DVD. So don't get confused if you see this number here. So there's nothing really to do here, just obviously verify this is correct, which it is. We'll click Next. Now, this is going to take a while because our server is going to need to copy those two files, the boot.wim file and the install.wim file to our server. And don't forget that those files are over 2 gig, they're around about 2.5 gig in total. So again, we're going to pause the video here and we'll come back in a moment once this process is complete. Okay, well it's done. Our images have been added to our server, so we can now click Finish. And up the top here, you'll notice that our warning icon here, that exclamation mark, is now gone. And WDS is humming along nicely, and it's basically ready to start deploying operating systems to machines that need one. Now, before we head off, though, and install some new machines using WDS, I want to show you a couple of other things first, including how you can add more images to your WDS server. Because you see, so far, We've added our images for the 64-bit edition of Windows 2008, but we might require the 32-bit edition as well, or Windows 7 or Windows Vista. So let's see how we can add those in here as well. So what we're going to do is we'll right-click on our server here, and we'll choose the top option, Properties. Now this defaults to showing us a new window with a bunch of tabs on the General tab here, which doesn't really do much except to tell us what we already know. We can see here the name of our server, and the location where we're storing our images. Now in our Pixie Response tab, you can see the policy that we've just configured. And we only just configured this, so you should recognize this. This is where we can choose how we're going to have our server respond to a Pixie request. Now you can set yours to none, or rather to not respond, like we've already discussed, and change it here to another response setting, if you like, once you've set up your WDS server and you're ready for it to start servicing requests. OK, well, let's move on. The next tab here is the Active Directory, Directory Services tab. And this is new, something we haven't talked about yet. What this tab does, and you'll see we've got two sections here. At the top, it's concerned with naming the computers that are installed by WDS. Or in other words, this is where we'll set up the computer account for our computers. Now, it does default here to showing this rather unfriendly looking string format here, which somehow results in a sample host name of a number followed by a username. So basically what you can do here is use this window to set up a naming policy of your own. Now, you don't obviously have to use this default one. So the whole idea here, of course, is that you want to have each computer have a unique computer account. It's not going to be any good to have all of our computers we deploy to have the same computer name. So this field here is going to, if we leave the default as it is, it's going to take the person's username and use that as part of the client's computer account. So this number part here, this 61, is going to be incremented each time just in case there happens to be two users with the same name. Now if you don't like the idea of using a username, you could change the word username here to say first, and that will only use the first name of a user. Now you could also change it to last, and that will only use the surname of a user. Now, or you could do away with all that and call it whatever you like. So we could call it, say, let's change this to, say, computer. And then each machine will have the name computer followed by a number. Now, if you do want to take a look at the other options you have here, let's just click on this how to specify this format link. And this will bring up the inbuilt help file here. And you're going to see here there's a lot of different variables you can use to arrive 
at the naming convention of your own choice. You can see we can use percent first name, we can use the last name, the username, the MAC address. There's quite a variety, quite a lot of different ways you could use this information to arrive at a naming convention for your own company. So what I'm going to do here, let's just minimize this, is I'm going to use a naming convention here. Let's say computer, we'll go computer percent 04. Now I'll use that as my naming convention here. That way what we're going to get is we're going to have each machine is going to have the name computer followed by a four digit number which will be incremented each time. So what we'll see here is 0001, 0002, 0003 and so forth. Now before we finish up here and to be completely honest with you this type of naming convention here really doesn't lend itself to naming servers because most of the time you're going to have a specific naming convention for servers based on their role or their location or something like that. Also in the majority of cases when you use WDS to roll out new servers it's not likely that you're going to be rolling out a hundred new servers. I mean that sort of stuff rarely happens in the real world. It's more likely that you'll only ever roll out a couple of servers at a time and it's not really a big deal to rename a couple of servers once they've been built. This tool though is really more likely to be used for client machines where it's entirely possible that you might want to roll out a whole lot of machines at once. So the default naming policy of username probably isn't a terrible idea but obviously that's your call. Whatever naming convention you choose to use is obviously going to be the one you go with. So at the bottom part of this window here we can choose where to create the computer account within Active Directory. Do we want to create it in the same domain as our WDS server? In the same domain where the users performing the installation because remember you might have several domains and it's possible that the client machine you're installing might want to live in a different domain to where your WDS server is. Now we can create the client account in the same OU where the user is running the WDS client or we could specify a totally separate location if we like. Now in most cases you're probably going to leave the default as it is unless you're installing the client into a different domain so we'll leave this alone, we'll leave it as it is We'll look at the next tab here which is the boot tab. Now this tab here shows us the boot program which is used to boot computers when they pixie boot. And each of them will run this program which will start up the computers and then ready them for the install image. Now on the client tab here this is where you can enable what's called an unattended installation. Now this isn't the unattended installation of the operating system which is going to be the topic of a follow up video to this one. With this screen here we're concerned with the unattended setup of the WDS portion of the installation. Right well our next tab is DHCP and here we can see the same settings that we configured earlier during the configuration of WDS. Obviously because our DHCP server lives on the same server as our WDS server we'll need to make sure that both of these two boxes are checked. So again WDS and DHCP if they're on the same server check both of these boxes. If they're on separate servers uncheck both of these boxes. Now our next tab here is where we can see our multicast IP addresses that we'll use. You can change these of course if you happen to be using other services that might be using addresses from this range. But in most cases you're probably not going to need to change anything here. Let's just leave the defaults. We'll move on to the next tab which is the advanced tab. And we can see the default here is to allow WDS to automatically discover any domain controllers. And remember it's going to need to know where domain controllers are in order to add machines to the domain and create the computer accounts. Now finally here you can see that this WDS server is authorized in DHCP which it needs to be or it won't work. Now final tab here is the network tab and we can just see that we're using the UDP port range of 64001 to 65000. Alright well let's move on. Let's just click OK here and before we go and start installing any images, deploying any images to our computers, let's just go and set up another image. Let's, let's do this one for Windows Vista. So let's expand our server here on the left and we'll select install images. Now over on the right you can see the image group that we created here for the 64-bit edition of Windows 2008. And if we double click on this, in here you're going to find all of the images, the eight images that we talked about and you're going to see that we've got images for our standard edition of Windows 2008 R2 which is our server core edition, the enterprise, the enterprise edition server core and so forth. 
So there's the eight images that we have available to be installed using WDS. So let's move on. We'll add in our Windows Vista images as well. So we're going to right click here on Install Images and we'll choose Add and Install Image. Now this will start up the Add Image Wizard and we're going to create a new group for this one. So let's change the name here from the default image group 1 and let's call this one Windows Vista and we'll call it X64 again, X64 that is, and we'll click Next. Now like before, we're going to need to browse for our WIM files, so we'll click Browse. Now I've already gone ahead and I've put our Windows Vista DVD in the drive, so I'm going to go to my D drive here. Again, we're going to go to our Sources folder. We'll select the install.wim file and we'll click Open. Now we'll click Next. Now you can see here that this particular install file here, this install.wim file, contains four images. And we can obviously select which ones we want to add. Now I'm not really a fan here of the Home Editions, so I'm going to uncheck those. We'll leave the two Business and Ultimate Editions and we'll click Next. All right, well, there's our summary. We're going to add these two Windows Vista images to our Windows Vista X64 image group. That's fine. We'll click Next. And these images are going to be added to our WDS server. Now, like before, this is going to take a few minutes because we've got a lot of data we need to copy over there. So we're going to take a brief pause here and we'll be back in a moment. All right, we're done. Windows Vista has now been added to our list of images. So let's click Finish. And there's our new group, which contains the two images. So let's do one more of these. Let's right click on Install Images. We'll choose the top option again to add an install image. That'll start up the wizard we saw before. Now let's create another group again. This time we'll go and install Windows 7. So I'll call this one Windows 7. X64 again. You might notice a theme here that I only like to use 64-bit editions of Windows wherever possible. So we'll try and use this to deploy Windows 7, of course. So we'll click Next. Now, as before, we'll need to browse to the location where our drive is. And, of course, that's going to be on our DVD drive in the Sources folder here. And the good news is you'll see that it actually does default to looking at the Sources folder since we only went there a moment ago, albeit on the Windows Vista disk. That's fine, so we're going to click the install.wim file. We'll select that. We'll click Open. Now we'll click Next. Now like with our Windows Vista image, the Windows 7 install file contains four images. And again, we can select which ones we want to add. Now I'm going to take out these pesky home editions. We'll leave it at Professional and Ultimate. We'll click Next. And we'll get our summary here. That's fine. We'll click Next again. And these images, again, will be added to our WDS server. Now, as before, this will take a few minutes, so we will pause again. We'll be back in just a moment. Okay, well, it's done. Windows 7 has now been added to our list of images. So let's click Finish. And there we have our new Windows 7 X64 group, which contains the two images. All right, well, it's time for us to start installing these operating systems to our machines. After all, that's what we came here for, right? To see how we can use WDS Server to do all of the work for us. So what we're going to want to do here is to use a multicast transmission to send out the image once and have all of the target machines grab it at the same time. So we're going to select multicast transmissions. And in the right-hand side here, you're going to notice that we don't have anything here yet. So we'll need to create one. So we're going to right-click on Multicast Transmissions, and we'll choose to create a Multicast Transmission. Now we'll need to give this a name. So we'll call it whatever we like, really, but I'm just going to give it a name. We'll say Create Two Servers, and we'll click Next. Now here we'll need to choose which image we're going to select to deploy to these machines. So from this drop-down list here, we're able to select our different image groups. Of course, Windows 2008, Windows 7, and Windows Vista. So let's just stick with the servers for now. We'll go with the Windows 2008. And in the bottom part of this window here, we can choose which edition of Windows Server 2008 we want to install. 
So let's go with the Enterprise Edition. So we'll select that from the list and we'll click Next. And now we'll need to specify when this transmission is going to take place. Now it's either going to take place automatically or on a schedule. Now the difference between these two is that with an automatic multicast transmission, whenever a client requests a transmission, it's going to start as soon as it's requested. Now if you choose a scheduled transmission, then only once either a certain number of clients are ready to receive an image or at a specific date and time will this transmission start. So I'm going to set this to a scheduled multicast and we'll set this to start once the number of clients that request our image is set to say two. That means we're going to deploy two servers and we'll click next. All right, we're done here, so we'll click finish. Okay, well, here's our multicast transmission and you can see it's currently set to the status of waiting. Since it's now sitting there, it's waiting for our two machines to come online to request an operating system before it starts deploying anything. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to use remote desktop to switch over to another machine that I've got here in the lab which is running Windows Server 2008 and that has Hyper-V installed. That way I'm able to create a couple of virtual machines and we'll use those virtual machines to simulate these two new servers. And obviously that's much easier than me having to go and find two real servers to use. Now it's exactly the same in practice though, just much cheaper and an easier solution for me to be able to demo this to you guys. All right, so I'm gonna go and fire up the remote desktop tool, which we'll find by clicking start going to all programs, then accessories, and here it is, remote desktop connection. And the machine I want to connect to is at 10.0.0.2, so we'll connect to that now. All right, now here we are connected to that machine, and I've already gone ahead and I've created a couple of virtual machines which I've called WDS Server 1 and WDS Server 2. Now these are just basic machines, 512 meg of RAM, they've got a network card, but the most important setting here to take stock of is in our settings. You'll note that here we've chosen to boot up this system from our network adapter. So when this machine actually does start booting, it's gonna require us to hit F12 on our keyboard to actually start the whole network booting process. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna fire up this machine, but I'm gonna hit the pause key on my keyboard here just so we can stop this thing in its track so we can quickly view what's actually happening when this system posts. All right, well, you can see here that we've got this MAC address here. We can see the MAC address of this system and this system's GUID. Now you'll also note that since this machine is booting to the network, it's trying to contact our DHCP server. So if we let this thing go a little bit, you'll note that it's been assigned an IP address from our DHCP server, which is at 10.32.0.2. The IP address that it's been given, of course, is 10.32.0.92. It's been given the correct subnet mask, and we can see the default gateway has been provided as well. Now, you'll also note that it's downloaded the boot image. It's a 64-bit boot image from our WDS server. And this is the file that it's going to run to boot to the network. Now, the final thing to take note of here is that you can see at the bottom, it does ask us to hit F12 on our keyboard in order to perform a network service boot. And ordinarily, we'd only get about 10 seconds to hit F12 or the boot itself is going to fail since we don't have an operating system installed yet on this machine. And if we don't happen to boot from an alternative source, such as a network, then this system's going nowhere. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to resume this machine by hitting the pause key on my keyboard, and then we'll quickly hit F12, and if we're quick enough, we'll be able to boot from the network. Okay, well, I wasn't quick enough, so let's just hit Escape, and we can try that again. Now we'll hit F12. Okay. And now we can see that the system's starting. Okay, so while the system's doing its thing, I'm going to quickly switch over to our second machine here. And let's fire this one up. So we're going to click Start here to get this machine started. Now again, this machine is going to want to boot to the network, so we'll hit F12. And let's just move this machine up a little bit because 
right now, down the bottom here, something I did neglect to point out with our first installation, is you'll note that it's connecting here to 10.32.0.2, which is the IP address of our WDS server. And of course, that's where it's going to get the files required to get this installation of Windows 2008 going. All right, well, let's quickly move this out of the way. It's not that important to me right at this moment. We'll switch back to our other machine. And the installation of Windows 2008, you can see, is starting. So we're asked to choose a couple of things, what location and keyboard style we want to use for this machine. I'm happy with those defaults. We'll just click Next. And then we're asked to enter in the username and password of an account that does have permission to access our WDS server to download an image. So I'm just going to use the administrator account here. So I'll need to enter in the domain and the administrator account. And finally, the password for that account. We'll hit OK. And as long as your account does have the required permissions, you're going to see a list of available images that you can deploy on this machine. Now, obviously, we're interested in the Enterprise Edition here. I believe that will be the second one. Okay, the regular GUI version, the Enterprise Edition of Windows 2008. So we'll select that. We'll click Next. Now we need to select our hard disk here. Again, nothing we haven't seen before when we've installed Windows using the manual method. We'll click Next. And at this point, the installation of our operating system is going to begin. Now, while that's going off and doing its thing, let's switch over here to our second machine. We'll just expand this. As before, we're just going to go through the defaults here. We'll click Next. We'll enter in the name of an account that's got permissions to fire up and connect to our WDS server. OK. Again, we'll choose the Enterprise Edition. We'll click Next. Now, before we click Next here, I just want to point out one thing. Let's go back to our WDS server. And you're going to note here that next to our Create Two Servers multicast transmission that we're currently using, you'll see it's currently got the status of waiting. So why is it waiting? In fact, let's click on this Create Two Servers link here. And you're going to see that we've currently got one machine listed here as waiting. So let's just refresh that. You recall that with our multicast transmission that we configured, we chose to schedule transmissions only when we have two machines that are ready to be deployed. Well, so far, you can see we've only got one. So what's going to happen is this machine's going to sit here in limbo with this status of waiting until a second machine comes online. So let's switch back here to our other machine and let's get this one going. OK, well, now you can see that it's switched over to the phase where we start copying all of the files across from our WDS server. And in fact, if we switch over to our second machine, we should be able to also see that one is in that phase as well. So let's switch back to our WDS server now and we'll go and refresh this screen. OK, well, here you can see we've now got two machines online. Our status has changed from waiting to a percentage. So we're going to be able to see here a visual indication of what data. In fact, there we go. We can start seeing some transfers happening. So what data is being sent down the line to our clients? Well, obviously, this is going to take a while because we're installing some operating systems here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit back and go and grab a coffee, pause the recording. We'll come back in 20 minutes or so once Windows 2008 requires some more input from us. All right, we've not got too far to go now. We just need to finish up the setup of Windows. And this is something that we'll see how to further automate in the next video. So here we're simply asked to input the country, the time currency, and the keyboard layout for this operating system. Now, to me, these defaults look fine, so we'll click Next. We need to accept the license agreement, so let's check the box, and we'll click Start. All right now, Windows is just going to go off, finalize what it needs to, and hopefully in a moment, Windows 2008 will begin to load into the desktop as we'd normally expect. OK, we're almost there. We just need to change our password, so let's quickly do that now. And we'll type it in once more. We'll hit Enter. All right, that's been changed. OK, and now we can see it preparing the desktop. 
All right, well, now that this machine has been built, let's just minimize this remote desktop connection here for a moment, and let's go back to our WDS server, which you'll also recall is our domain controller. So if we go and click Start, and we'll fire up Active Directory Users and Computers, there it is. All right, right here inside our computers container, you'll notice that we've got a computer account in here for both of these two new servers, and they've been given the names of computer 0001 and obviously 2. So there you can see how that naming convention part of our WDS configuration works there. So in this video, we've seen how we can use WDS Windows Deployment Services to install the Windows operating system on one or more machines in our network. Now, it has been a rather long ride to get here, but not a particularly difficult one. But in the next video, though, we're going to take this automation one step further, where we can see how we can create an answer file to further automate this deployment process. So we hope you've enjoyed this video and would like to thank you for watching.